Hello everyone and welcome to this UK Data Service webinar on what are APIs. I'm Margarita Serrala and I'm an Outreach Officer working for the UK Data Service and based in Manchester at JISC. And presenting today is Peter Smythe. He's a Research Associate at the University of Manchester and he's working within the UK Data Service training team. Okay, thank you Margarita. I'm just going to bring up my PowerPoint slides. Going to, there we go. Um, and welcome everyone for joining us today. Um, in this webinar, as we've already said, we are going to talk about APIs. So the overview is we'll, I'll describe what an API is. I'll give some examples of APIs. We'll um, discuss how you find out how to use an API using the provided documentation. And then we'll look at a, a browser-based demo of an API and some code-based demos of APIs. So first off, let's have a definition from Wikipedia. An API is a set of routines, protocols, and tools for building software applications. In fact, it's, it's wider than that because it's not just software applications. It's really about how applications talk to one another or how people talk to applications. It expresses a software component in terms of its operations, inputs, outputs, and underlying types. Operations, inputs, and outputs are the key points here. We're defining how you talk to, how you make requests to an application, and how the application is going to respond to those requests. It defines the functionalities are independent of their respective implementations. Now what this means is that if I was to take an example, if I was to ask, make a request to sort a set of numbers, then the response I would get, expect to get back is a sorted set of numbers. But at no point do I try to influence how that set of numbers is to be sorted. And in the background, there's a, an overall lot of sorting algorithms which could be used. But we don't really need to know that from the API point of view. We just need to know that if we make a valid request to sort a set of numbers, we get back a sorted set of numbers. Okay. Um, a programmer can use an API to build an application. Absolutely true. But in our case, um, because an API isn't just about applications talking to applications, the type of API we're going to be particularly interested in is where we as end users, with the help of our PCs and some programming code or whatever, are going to make a request to another application, whether it's a web server or a web service, and ask that application for some data. And it's the data that comes back that we hopefully want to make use of in our um, uh, analysis or research. So to put it another way, or more succinctly, an API hides complexity of the implementation, and using the API allows the implementation to change without affecting the users. So let's have a look at a generic API in terms of in pictures. We have application A, and we've got application B. Application B makes a request of some kind to application A, and application A gives a response. It's that simple. The actual API part of that diagram is the request and response in the middle. Application A and application B just need to understand the APIs. And of course, application B, in this case, isn't necessarily a software application. It could be you, an end user, typing something into a web browser, for example. Or it could be program code that you've written. So let's consider uh, within this application, or within this API, who, which part you need to know what information. Well, certainly, if your application B, you need to be able to correctly format the request into, into some predetermined, uh, pre-established set of, of requirements. You're going to format the request, and you've got to be able to send that to application A. When application A gets that request, it needs to understand what it is you're talking about. And at the same time, it needs to collate the response to that and send that off to you, application B. Application B, when it gets a response, it needs to know how to interpret that response. Let's consider what you don't need to know or who doesn't need to know what. Application A 
who's receiving the request doesn't need to know what application does with the response. In fact, it, application A doesn't even know, he need to know who or what application B is. On the other hand, application B doesn't need to know how, uh, how application A creates a response from the requests. So this is similar to, to uh, this is a bit like the, the example I gave before with the, the sorting of a set of numbers. As long as the response has the sorted set of numbers, application B doesn't really need to understand how application A actually created that set of sorted numbers. So in specific cases, um, application A is typically some kind of web service or, or, or website itself. It could be a simple website just returning web pages. If you, if you think about it, if you put in a URL into your web browser, a full URL, you expect the web site that you're sending that to to return you a, a nicely formatted page of information. So that is a very simple version of making use of an API. If you don't ask for the right page, or you get back the page which you specify in that request to the web to the website. You could also just be asking for a stream of data in response to a, a search request, and this is probably the situation where we're more interested in. Rather than actually wanting some nicely formatted web page, we just want to make a request for I need information based on this, this set of criteria and then the response comes back and it's just a stream of data coming back to you and then it's down to you to interpret that data correctly and make best use of it. So that's application A. Application B, which is the, the user side of things, it could be anything. Um, a smartphone app, unless you're actually listening to local music or, or watching local video, almost all smartphone apps make use of APIs to connect to some kind of web service in, in the cloud. So when you're, um, say, on, on trying to look up train times, you, you put in, say, I want to go from station A to station B, that information, the, the answer to that question, if you like, isn't on your smartphone. That has to be formulated into a proper API request and sent off to some application like the train line or whatever, and then the response comes back as a stream of data and then it's your smartphone app which makes it look nice on the screen and make it easy for you to read. Um, application B could also be a, a simple web browser, it could be some kind of development tool, or it could be program code. And there's probably more as well. But the last, last three we'll actually see examples of as we, as we go through this webinar. So pictorially, if you like, we have application A, application B, We've got various requests and responses going between them. And application A, as we said, could be just a website, or it could be web services. Application B could be your smartphone. It could be program code. It could be um, a development tool, or it could be a web browser. And like I said, that's not meant as an exclusive set of options there. But the point is, the separation between application A and B is they don't need to know who's talking to whom uh, and, and, uh, and so on. They just need to be able to correctly format a request and understand the response that comes back. And this is really what leads to the flexibility of APIs. Although the, the format of the request and the response is fixed and, and very rigid, doesn't well documented, doesn't change. That, that, that's why it is such a good tool, an, a, an API, because the, the structure doesn't change. But behind the scenes, the requester who's making that request could, as we saw in the previous slide, could be anything from a, to you typing in code on your keyboard to a, some kind of smartphone app. And equally, the responder, as long as it understands your request and is able to respond to it, how it actually creates that response is of no real interest to you. So that can be changed over time without it affecting how your, say, smartphone app works. If you think about it, if that wasn't the case, if we didn't have this rigidity of, of the, how the API actually communicates between the two applications, if anyone changed the web service application, 
that your smartphone was de app was depending on, whenever they changed it, you'd have to get a new version of the smartphone app. And that's not really very practical. So, some examples of APIs. Well, as, as you, you, I'm sure you'd be very unsurprised to know, Twitter has an API, and Facebook has an API, but lots of other people do as well. The Met Office has quite a, a simple-to-use API where you can get weather forecasts and the like. The Guardian has an API where you can get information about articles, you can search for terms and what have you, and that's going to be one of our demonstrations in a few minutes. There's a, a transport API, which is actually um, a, a generic organization which collects information about all transport systems, I think, in, in the UK. And again, you would use that by asking specific information about some, um, some type of transport in some location and so on. And we'll, we'll see that in a minute. Um, Google Maps, uh, I, I've said Google Maps, but Google in general have a whole host of APIs, Google Maps just being one particular example of it, or, or one particular example of, of an API they have, and that allows you to send information that your, your coordinates, your longitude and latitude, and it returns you a little map segment which you put on, on your um, web browser, or show in your web browser or other application. Um, interesting enough, the, the, the general text search API from Google is, is now depreciated in that they, they don't actually maintain it as such. But of course, every time you do a Google search, your search term is becomes part of an API call back to Google, who then return the set of results for that search. So it, it's still there, it's still in everyday use, and it's probably the best example of using an API where you don't realize you're actually using one. So, how do you use an API? It's really very simple. You make a request, you get a response. The reason why it's not really quite that simple is you need to decide how to formulate that correct into something which the API is, is, is going to accept. And when you get a response, you need to work out how to interpret that response. So if, if we look at um, the transport API, which I mentioned before, this is an example of a call to the transport API. And you can read that if you like. I'm not sure how you'd read it. But you can see in here there's, there's little things like bus and stop and live HTML and route and API key and I, app ID and so on. So all this information is what you get from the documentation. And you'd need to know how to construct that call before you can make a valid response, a, a valid request to this transport API. But you should be able to get all that from the API documentation. And then when you get the response, it looks like something like this. Now, for those of you who have done any kind of um, programming, this may not look too bad. It's a, in a JSON, what's called a JSON format, and it's sort of readable. You get the idea that, oh, well, we're talking about a bus, bus number perhaps 243 going towards Wood Green in London. Oh, yeah, TFL, Transport London. You can sort of interpret it, but it's probably not really what you'd want to end up with on a, on a screen in application. It's more likely that if it's coming back in this form, you may want to make use of this um, to extract information for further analysis and so on. Perhaps combine this with data you're receiving from other APIs, perhaps. So, um, I've already mentioned API documentation. It is absolutely essential to read and understand the API documentation. Basically, all of the APIs will have documentation somewhere. It's just a case of finding the right set of documentation for your API, which you can typically find by saying Google Space API or Guardian API, and it'll come up with the um, API information. We'll look at that in a minute. Why you need to know the API documentation? Well, the first two points, bullet points here, you need, how to fo need to know how you format the requests so that the other application understands it. And exactly how you do this, quite likely with examples, will be in the API documentation. You also know, as seen from the last two screens, you need to understand how the format and what is likely to be in the responses which come back. The response in that previous slide is 
uh, a clear response is the response to that request. But if I'd miss miss typed something in that request and it couldn't understand it, then this response may be completely different, effectively just giving you some kind of error message. So when you're looking at the documentation, you need to understand not only what a correct response looks like, but what it might return in, in, in terms of errors and, and things like that. Now, the other things you need to know about APIs when you're, you're starting to use them for programming and things like that, or writing your applications, is that um, quite often the API provider will expect you to use a, a key which you have to um, sign up for. Um, typically, the, the, the keys are free and they'll give you some kind of usage of the API. There may be limitations on that use, but again, all of this information, how to get a key and how you're going to be limited in using that key will be in the API documentation. So certainly, if I go back to this one up here, you can see here in this transport API, there's an API key and some long key value there. And that, that's quite typical. Most APIs will require this sort of arrangement. So if we look at an API, a specific API, this is a Guardian um, API, the Guardian newspaper. Um, it's, it's quite good for a couple of reasons. One of which is it's quite simple, and the second thing, it's got this open platform to record Explore, which allows you to um, experiment with this API in your web browser and get a feel for how it works and what kind of results you're going to get. So I'm just going to show you a little demonstration of that. Um, right, if you go to the... Um, Open platform, the Guardian com access. Again, if you just type in Guardian API in Google, you'll get to this page quite happily. Okay, and this is where it's going to describe the first page of the API documentation, if you like. If you click on the documentation here, it will take you into far more details of exactly how to construct queries and types of parameters you can use, how you can use um, filter um, operations and and all to build up complex queries and so on and so forth. So everything you, you're going to need to do in order to construct a valid request to this API is in this documentation. And you can go through that at your leisure if you're looking to use this. Um, but if I just go back a page, what this page also tells me is that I need to register for a key. And that's just a simple form filling exercise, so we won't go through that. And at the bottom here, it will tell you, as having got your key as a developer, the, this is what you can expect from the API in terms of limitations. So you can make up to 12 calls to this API per second, which is clearly aimed at some automated process rather than you typing. You can have 5,000 calls per day, you get access to the article text, and there's one three quarter million of those. Um, if you're prepared to pay, and again, some of the bigger um, API providers will have a, a, a commercial aspect to them, and you can get effectively just more if you're prepared to pay for it. But for, for simple requests, um, and certainly when you're starting off, uh, a free developer type key is probably going to be more than what you need. So the next thing that we have in, in the Guardian platform is this button up here which is labeled explore. If you click on that, what you get is effectively this is a little application in your browser and this application is going to explain to you or help you understand how the Guardian API works. So up here we're going to put a search term. Um, so today we're going to use, because it's quite topical, Brexit. Right. Now, as I was typing that, or as soon as I finished typing that, you can see down here where it has actually constructed the API core. So we've got a, a, a normal URL type thing here. We're saying search, uh, question mark, query is for Brexit, and we've got an API key, which is test. We're going to use, rather than actually applying for our own API key, we're just going to use test for these examples because we can get enough information back using the test key. 
okay um, I can if I wanted to I can add filters for sections tags and all the various things so you can use this screen to actually build up requests to, to the API and it instantly shows you what data is going to be returned within the API so you get some basic information there then you've got a result of 10 articles on Brexit, which are coming back, and tells you that it's an article, a fair bit of information when they were published, and it even gives you a web URL. So if you click on that, you will actually, if I just do that and say open a link in a new tab, it will actually take you to that page. That is a live um, link. So that, that, that's quite good. That's a very useful tool if you want to use the Guardian API. The problem is, very few API providers will provide you with such a nice tool to allow you to get a feel for how the API works. You sit, they'll all provide you with documentation and examples perhaps, but they won't actually give you a nice little tool like this. So what you can do, um, just go back to the slides. What you can do, you can use a tool called Fiddler. Now, Fiddler was developed as a web development tool, and as such, it's open source and it's free. You can download it, install it on, on your PC, um, and it's capable of a great number of things that web developers typically want to do to test things out and try this, that, and the other. From our point of view, we only want to be able to send requests to an API and examine the responses from that API. So that's rather limited. So when I show you Fiddler, here, you can see it's a very crowded, cluttered sort of screen, which might be a bit off-putting for those who haven't seen this sort of environment before. But we're going to make very simple use of it. If I just um, go back to my Guardian, um, oops, Guardian. this um, example which we constructed with Brexit and API tests, I'm just going to copy that and go back into Fiddler and if I say Composer and in there, oh, I've, already, I've, left, I've left it in there from last time, we've got that same API call that we've just constructed in the Guardian Explorer and I'm just going to execute that request and nothing appears to happen in here but on this side you can see that it's made the request um, a result of 200 is good, that means it, it's that's equivalent of OK. And if I double click on that, in the bottom of the screen now, you can actually see what was returned in terms of the data. And Fiddler knows it can work out that th this response is actually in JSON format, as I, I I'm, think I might have mentioned before, but certainly the Guardian response is in JSON format. And it will actually neatly lay out this JSON for you just so you can see all of the data which was being returned. And in fact, this the layout of this is almost identical to what the Guardian Explorer little tool does. So it, it's doing much the same thing. The advantage of using Fiddler is that it, this will work for any API i.e. all of the ones which don't provide you with that nice little explorer tool. You still have the problem, well, how do you read this JSON and what can you do with it and so on and so forth. But at least it'll give you a far clearer idea of what is actually being returned. And equally, had I got that response, um, if I'd got something wrong in that request, so if I, if I try and do it without an API key, for example, and say execute. Um, straight, uh, there you are. I think it's probably that one there. A 401. 401 is error code for not authorized. So if I double click on that, it will tell me that there's a problem with it. So even then, even when you get things wrong, Fiddler will actually tell you exactly what the other side was saying and give you some kind of interpretation of it. So Fiddler, a useful tool if, you've got, if you're trying to use an API which doesn't provide you with a nice little um, explorer type tool as in here. So back to the slides, that's Fiddler. So let's look at the, Guardian, the example from the Guardian. 
this is um, we're going to use our our programming language for this um, and what we're going to do is we're going to format a request as we know we have to do we're going to send that request and get a response to it and then we're going to look at we're going to pass that response and extract the web URL the web URL was that link I clicked on before to get the actual page to come up and then for the set of results we get we're going to collect all of those web pages and then just for fun we're going to create um, a word cloud all in R so if we bring up R let me just clear out everything I've got in there in a minute okay Guardian R I'll quickly run through this it's not meant as a, an R teaching exercise but basically I've got a load of libraries I'm starting up with a couple uh, just a bit of um, um, housekeeping type stuff for the the um, graphs up the charts I'm going to draw of the word clouds um, I've set my search term to brexit I could obviously change that to anything I want I'm going to make a call to the API here so this line here is going to make my is actually just setting up the string of the request so it's just going to put this information in there so if you move along here you can see it's I've got my search term in there and I've got my API of test in there and then this next line line 18 is actually going to make the request get the results back and put the results into this date this response variable here and then because we already know it's in JSON format we're going to use a function called from JSON to read that response and create a data frame from it and then from that data frame we are going to extract the a rather convoluted way of doing it but from that we are going to extract the web URL and we're going to make sure it's got an S on the end and then for each one we're going to read the, the we're going to use something called HTML tree pass which will again make a request for that web URL and it will get the result and it will store the results in doc HTML we're then going to just manipulate that to get rid of stuff we don't want and then we're going to this bit down here is going to be the word cloud so let me just clear my previous examples there and what I'm going to do, I'm just going to run all of this together because it does run quite quickly, this one, hopefully. And so you can see down here, as it starts getting these 10 pages back, it's making little word clouds of the various words in, in those pages. And I don't know if, made, if you haven't seen a word cloud before, the size of the, of the font, if you like, represents in proportion how often those words are occurring so consequence consequences is obviously the, the most frequently used ex um, word in this page and things like just is used less often um, obviously this is just as a demonstration in reality you could use this to do frequency counts and all sorts of other things so that's using the, the Guardian API Um, oops, finishes that one. So the next one we want to look at is a Twitter example. Twitter, I think, is is possibly one of the more complicated APIs, not only to to understand because there's so much of it, but also by virtue of the fact that you need to have a set of four keys before you can use it. And you, you can only get keys by creating an application from this starting at this point here. And you can't create an application unless you've actually got a Twitter account. So your first step is actually creating a Twitter account. Then you can go there and create what's called an application. It's a simple form filling in. I'm not going to go through that now, but we will um, hopefully provide you a guide on how to do that. Um, but basically, you end up with a set of four keys, not just one. And then in Twitter we've also got another decision to make because when you want to retrieve tweets you can either make a search of um, what's called the, the recent 
database of tweets which is is maintained and typically that's about seven days the last seven days of, of all tweets and you can say search within there to extract tweets on whatever subject you're, you're looking for or alternatively you can use what's called the streaming API to capture tweets as <laughs> tweets as they occur um, and the thing about this is that only about one percent a one percent sample is actually made available to you and obviously there's no guarantee you're going to get all of the the tweets which actually reference your search term anyway so whatever your whatever method you're using what you've got to remember about um, Twitter and retrieving tweets is you, you, you shouldn't really have any expectation of getting every tweet with that search term in it it's only ever going to be some kind of sample so our first search of Twitter, we're going to use R code again. We're going to use a library called Twitter, surprisingly enough. We're going to need to set up our authorization using the four keys if we have. We're going to again search for the keyword Brexit. In a, and we're going to do this separately over four different days. And then we're going to save the text into a single data frame, extract, extract the hashtags from the tweets, and again, just work, create a word cloud to show what we've what we've returned. So back into R. Let me just clear them out. And I'm also going to clear out all of them so we can start afresh. Um, if you're wondering what these 30 warnings were, it's because um, if you don't make the, the the grid of this pane large enough to display the word cloud, it misses out some of the longer words or some of the words. Um, but again, for example, that's not something that we're terribly concerned with. So let's just look at some of this R code. Again, this first part is just setting up the libraries and um, the, the color palette. This section down here, which I've commented out, is how you would set up your API, your keys. So you've got something called an API key, an API secret, an access token, and an access token secret. And when you've got all of them and, and put into these variables, you then call set up Twitter OAuth, which is part of the Twitter library, to set up your access into Twitter. And from then on, you can actually just do things like search Twitter and then give it instructions of what you want to search. So if I just run all of this up front, um, just in really general, you can see up here where the access token keys have been put in place and so on and so forth. So they, they've been used to create my authorization in, into, into Twitter. The next bit I'm going to run is I've got separate lines here for each day for four different days. So I'm searching between 21st and 22nd, 22nd, 23rd, and so on and so on. So I've got four days of searches there. And what I've said at the end is I want, I've put n equal to 1,000. So that's the number of tweets I wanted to return. So in each case, I wanted to return 1,000 tweets. I'm just going to set that off because that'll take a minute or so to run. And while I'm that waiting for that, let me just explain that this n value here, you can set it up to 5,000 and it will uh, return 5,000 up to 5,000 in one call. But the way I'm running this one after the other like this, if I try to do that, what would happen is that I would actually run into the limitations that Twitter imposes on me for my, for my free access using my keys. And what happens in the case of um, the Twitter R library and using search Twitter is that it will run as far as it can and then it will um, let me try and show you what happened this is when I tried earlier when I had n set to 5000 and the first three worked quite happily and then on the fourth one well I ran into a snag because there's rate limited blocking for a minute and retrying up to 119 times, which is quite good because eventually when we got down to 110, it was my, my um, rate limited blocking was over because it's time related and it was able to get the last set of 5,000 tweets. Um, this is an example of a, a, an AP, um, 
the the package the Twitter package in R is very good in that it will do this for you there may be other packages which might just say well oh, I asked for, for 5,000 and it just sent me this error message. Here's the error message you, you have to deal with it. So it's quite good because you can actually just set this off and, and go away and have a cup of tea. And even if you've got to wait an extra 10 minutes down here, you do eventually get back what it is you're hoping to get returned. So that's all finished. So all I'm going to do, I'll just run these all together because they're basically... Um, on day one, I'm just running day one, and I'm going to create a word cloud, as I did before. And then day two, I'm adding day one to day two, and then day one to day two to day three. And then finally for day four, I've got all four of them. So if I just run that, that as that runs through, again, I'll start getting um, word clouds for... And then these are word clouds based on the hashtags of all of the tweets that I returned. And given that um, I give the, my original search term was Brexit, um, you can see that obviously vote leave is, is very strongly associated with it and stronger in, which is I think the other side, and EU referendum. So things that you, you sort of like might expect to be prominent are indeed prominent. But again, obviously, this is just for demonstration. You've got the, the, the tweets coming back, what you do with them, is going to be dependent on what your um, requirements are going to be. So let's end of that example. So back to, we've got one more example to go through. And this is going to be, oops, that was the R code. And now we're going to look at streaming Twitter and we're going to use Python code for here. We're going to do something, well, not quite as adventurous, perhaps. We're going to use a package called Tweepy, which is a, a Python package, which, again, freely available, like Python itself. You just download and install it. You still need your exact same four authorization keys. Um, and then what we're going to do is to search, again, using Brexit. We're going to get some tweets, and we're going to return these, and we're going to write them to a file. And at the same time, we're going to write something on the screen just so that you can see that this is happening in, in real time. So, um, where do I want to be? Not there. Explorer. Right. This is the um, Python code. I'm running this in a, as a Jupyter notebook. Again, for those people who use Python, you're probably familiar with that. For people who don't use Python and thinking about trying it, then um, using Jupyter is, is very very, very useful in terms of helping you develop in small chunks of code. So at the top here, I've got a small chunk of code, which I'm good from uh, some import statements from Tweepy to get hold of all the things I want. I also need to import, import JSON and IO as well. If I just oops, I click on that and just run it, there's no, it has run. You can tell by that four up there, um, but there's no actual response, so it doesn't really show you anything different. There's no output from that. And equally here, where I'm setting up my four keys, and this bit of code down here is effectively saying what I want to do when I get a tweet back. The tweet comes back in this variable here called data, and what I'm saying here in these three lines is, or four lines, um, I want you to show me or five lines, if you like. I want you to read the data, the tweet that's come back. I want you to extract the text from it, the created at date, time, and who did it, the user screen name. And I've called them tweet name and user time. And I want you to print that on the screen. And also, in addition to that, I just want you to take the whole tweet which came back and write it to this file here. Now, at the moment, that file doesn't exist. It's going to write it into this folder here. So, I'm, again, this is just setup information. So, I'm just when I run that, this changes to a file to say it's been run, but there's no visible effect 
of that at the moment. It's this last section here where I set up my authorization keys using authorization to Twitter using my keys and then I set up a Twitter stream saying I want to use my authorization keys. Listener is this section up here telling it what to do when you get tweets back and then finally I'm putting in here I want you to search for tweets uh, or listen out for if you like tweets which contain the word Brexit. So when I run, oops, when I run this one, then you can see here this is just shown as an asterisk because it's still running, and in a minute or two, oh, oh dear, it's broke. Well, that is very unfortunate. Oh, certificate verify fail, certificate verify fail. Okay, um, most unfortunate. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close that down and try it again. Just bear with me for half a minute. Oh, that could be the problem. Perhaps it was already closed down. Um, right, so this is a live demo, obviously, which is why it's not working. It's fair for me when I try this again. this again. Um, and run that one, run that one, run this one. And hope, oh no, it's failed again. Um, okay, I think I'm going to have to stop at that point. That doesn't seem to want to work. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll try and set that up as a little bit of video and provide that on the website. Um, what it would have shown you is, um, instead of this error message, it would have shown you a bit of text with the tweets in it and who sent them and when they sent them. And in our, our folder up here, it would have actually collected all of the data from the tweets. And the point about doing that is, or, or demonstrating that is that typically what we selected here, um, text created at and screen name, um, or, or t things that you will typically want to extract from a tweet. But the reality is that a tweet consists of an awful lot more of information. And when we're storing into the file, then you actually store the whole tweet. And so you, if this was actually working, you'd see this file size increasing. It's three or four kilobytes for each tweet that is being recorded or being saved. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sure what has gone wrong there, but um, like I said, I'll look into it and we'll produce a little video with that example on. Sorry about that. So back to the um, slides. I think there's only a couple left. So unfortunately that one didn't work. But you, you have to decide which approach is going to be most appropriate to you, whether it's okay to just search within the last seven days on a regular basis, perhaps on a daily basis, or whether you want to actually stream um, tweets as you are on a, um, you know, in a, in a sort of live environment. So if you do want to scale up, and this applies to any of the APIs that we've looked at or the ones we haven't looked at, um, you may want to extract data from the, these APIs on a regular basis. And the way to do that, you'll have to just, just think of a, of a couple of things like scheduling a regular request, so i.e. running your um, Twitter pro, search Twitter program once a day or something like that. And you don't want to be logging in and typing this all in every time. So you may want to automate this in some way. So if you're using um, 
a Linux type system you can use cron to automate it or in Windows you can use something called a task scheduler which is on all Windows desktops it's just a very rarely used little bit of application which you can use to set up to say run this program at 8 o'clock every morning assuming the machine's powered on. Um, a more simplistic way is that you can actually start the program yourself and then within the program have looping code which just says X, find me 5,000 tweets, wait an hour, run it, and then loop around and get another 5,000 tweets so that you don't ever run into your time limits or, or restrictions and things like that. Um, the other thing you might want to do is we sort of showed this in the um, Guardian example where we started off by using the, the Guardian API to extract information on articles related to Brexit and then we used the information that came back to make a further call, not, not to the same API but to the, the standard web page API to get a web page to come back. And then we, we extract the data from that. Now, you can, it's easy to imagine that as you, for other APIs, you may start off um, with a certain set of information. You pick something out. You may use that to formulate another call to the API and so on and so forth. So you can imagine how, depending on your, on your requirements, and the coding may, in fact, um, become a little bit more complicated. Um, so it's something to think about. And then lastly, um, as we thought we didn't quite see in, in that streaming Twitter example, um, if you're going to start collecting lots of data from APIs, especially the likes of Twitter, which is quite verbose, then you will you may want to persist that data. It's not just going to be in your little session that you're running. You may want to write that to a file as I was trying to do there, or you may want to write it to a database or something like that so that you can subsequently make use of that and um, do the analysis at some future date and you've got a, um, a persisted storage of, of what it was you collected and when you collected. And um, the, the webinar we're doing next month is on a subject, um, a database called MongoDB, which is quite often used to, to record information from the likes of um, Twitter, things which comes back in JSON format. But there are other options like SQLite if you're using R and, and so on and so forth. So again, depending on your use case, you may want, need to consider how you're going to persist the data for future use. Um, finally, um, books on APIs. Um, the, the problem with APIs is that, as, as we've already said, you really need to use the proper documentation for the API that you're hoping to use to find out exactly how to do the things that you might want to do. But having said that, things like the, the, the Twitters and the Facebooks and all the, the common social media APIs, um, they're, they're not only well documented, documented by the providers, books uh, do appear which will give you examples of how to use them. So in this first one, this one is based on R, Mastering Social Media Mining with R. This will certainly give you examples of using the Twitter API and the Facebook API, I think, uh, and several others and just general um, searching techniques using um, APIs and web pages and what have you. And similarly, this one is in Python for Python coders and again it will again give you examples of how to use the Twitter API, how to use the Facebook API and, and several others from what I remember. But they, they will give you, they're good if you just want simple examples and you're not very familiar with, with the, the languages that they're using, um, but they're not really substitutes for actually going to the API documentation and having a look at that to see what's in there. But it'll get you started, certainly. So I'd just like to thank everyone for joining. I hope you found it useful. And uh, there's more information on our events pages if you want to attend other webinars, for example, the MongoDB one. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Peter, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.